Okay. All right. So it's six o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mary Beth Franken. I am one of the admission counselors here at St. Norbert College. Uh, we're very excited to have some of our illustrious faculty from the natural sciences joining us here today to answer any and all questions that you have as students. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, so if everyone could make sure that you mute, mute yourself unless you're talking, that would be great just to kind of eliminate some of the background noise here. Um, and students, if you have questions for the faculty here, um, please use the chat function. Um, and that will allow me to kind of be the one to read the questions. Um, and then we will go from there. And, and I think that the faculty will have a lot to talk to us about and a lot to share. So I think it's going to be a pretty quick hour. Um, and then I will, at the end of the presentation, there is contact information for all of the faculty and then all of the admission teams as well. So um, make sure you either screenshot that or uh, grab pen and paper so you can write down the contact information. So I will actually scroll now to the um, introductions for the faculty um, and then allow the faculty to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Dr. Bailey. Hi everyone, Dave Bailey. I'm the Dean of Natural Sciences and uh, Professor of Biology. I also teach for uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin Green Bay. So for the first year medical students, I teach a medical neuroscience course um, on St. Norbert's campus. That's where the Medical College of Wisconsin Green Bay is located and right in our science building. And then for the second year medical students, I teach some uh, physiology or portions of the physiology unit, not only to the Green Bay students, but also to the Central Wisconsin uh, campus and then the Milwaukee campus as well. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, is Carrie here? I don't see her. Okay, then we will move on to Dr. Ham. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Um, my name is Dr. Ham. I'm a professor of geology and environmental science. I've been at the college for 26 years. Um, my teaching specialties, um, besides introductory courses, are research and teaching in a landscape. So how did the landscape of Wisconsin come to be through past climate change uh, and also what might happen in the future? And I also uh, teach courses in hydrology, surface hydrology, so about rivers and lakes, and also about groundwater. And all of those courses are taken both by geology students and students in the environmental science program who uh, typically are interested in the ecological side of environment. And so one thing that I try to do is bridge um, those two um, areas, geology and ecology, um, because there's a lot of interest in research in the connections between the two, how kind of one informs the other. And that's, that's basically what I teach at the college. Thank you. All right, Dr. McVeigh. Hey, I'm Bonnie McVeigh. I teach computer science at St. Norbert. I've been at St. Norbert now for 20 years, and I'm a St. Norbert grad from a long time ago. Um, I did math and business as a student. Uh, my interests in computer science are pretty much the whole thing. I came here as a theorist. So how do things work? What can we do? What can't we do? Because there are plenty of things we can't. Um, but um, I teach those. I teach intro. I teach um, Android application development, um, desktop development. So um, I have a lot of fun. Thank you. Dr. Meyer? Yeah, so uh, I'm Dr. Meyer. I'm a math professor here. Um, uh, my teaching areas are math and education. If you're interested in either secondary or earlier education, I teach a lot of those content courses. Um, my research area is linear algebra and discrete math. So I was actually a math and computer science major once upon a time as a student. Um, so, uh, and then uh, I, as many of the math faculty do, we have quite a few research opportunities. So one of my um, research students from last year is actually starting an applied math program uh, at Marquette for a PhD uh, this fall. So that's briefly. Great, thank you. And Dr. Olson.
Good evening, I'm Dr. Michael Olson. I'm a senior physicist here at St. Norbert College. Uh, my background is in nuclear and particle physics, uh, both working at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and more recently at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. Um, within our curriculum, I, uh, I teach across the physics curriculum. My specialties are relativity, modern physics, and quantum theory, uh, as, as, and nuclear and particle physics is a special topics course. Um, my research interests are in medium to high energy nuclear and particle physics, uh, looking at discontinuities in the strong nuclear force between low and high energies, and more recently, in, uh, the unification of the electromagnetic and weak nuclear forces um, and electron scattering. Great, thank you all so much. So just a quick note for the students who are on the call. Uh, one thing that was suggested yesterday by one of our faculty and our general faculty panel that I thought was a great idea was uh, whichever student asks the first question of our faculty, uh, we'll send you a little bit of St. Norbert swag. So don't be shy in asking any questions that you have. Um, but while we wait for those to come in, um, one, one thing that I think a lot of prospective students are curious about is kind of what is the relationship that you have with your students? What does that look like at a smaller school like St. Norbert College? Um, and what does that look like from your perspective as a faculty? So whoever wants to start, this is really free form. I, I can start. Um, obviously, as a St. Norbert grad, um, one of the reasons I came back here is because of the relationship I had with um, my teachers and how well they knew me and how well I knew them. Um, things have changed a little bit now with the ability not so easy to drop in and visit and talk, but um, I will tell you that I've been online with numerous students over the summer about projects they're working on out of curiosity for themselves, a self-learning project. Um, and, and the different uh, opportunities for grad school and the like, I've been meeting with several of them as well. But the best part about coming back here, and I did teach um, eight, 10 years at an at a institution that had um, 15,000 students, um, we really get to know our students. And so when you need that letter of recommendation or you need advice about uh, looking at jobs and the like, we can we can talk with you from a position of knowledge and um, i've always enjoyed doing that with my students and i think that's one of the things we do really well here at st norbert thank you anyone else want to jump in yeah i can speak to that question i think the one of the things that really drove me to um, do what I do now, not necessarily the administrative stuff as the dean, but the, uh, the teaching and the research stuff is the opportunity that I had as an undergraduate. So I did my undergraduate at a large institution, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So at the time it was something like 20,000 undergraduate students, uh, but I had an opportunity to work in a research lab. And it was a neuroscience research lab that I started in, I think, as a sophomore um, and was able to, you know, work for a couple of years. I had a job in that lab working as a technician uh, after that point. And uh, I really came to value uh, just that entire process, working really closely with other students and with uh, my faculty mentor. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to do something like that, but I wouldn't have that opportunity at uh, a larger institution. And something I tell students all the time is uh, when you're taking a biology course or a chemistry course or a physics course or a math course, or a CS course, and the list goes on, right? Um, the content that you're learning is pretty much gonna be the same wherever it is you go. A cell looks exactly like another cell, whether you're learning that at a St. Norbert College or at a uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, but the opportunity to have that close contact with faculty members that Dr. McVeigh uh, indicated is really crucial. That's one of the things that draw uh, faculty to uh, St. Norbert College is the ability to do that. And yes, we do research and publish and write grants and do all that stuff. Um, but doing that collaboratively uh, with students is a real, uh, a real benefit.
Anyone else want to share? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Ham. Yeah, I can uh, I can add a little bit to that. I agree absolutely with what um, Bonnie and Dave said. I kind of went through this situation like many of you who are thinking about coming to St. Norbert um, back when I was your same age. I transferred into a school called Augustana College, which is in Illinois. Um, I was a first generation college student. Um, we were transferred there uh, when my dad was moved there in the military when he was getting ready to re retire. And um, it transformed my life. Um, it was a situation where there was a small program. Uh, a person kind of took me under their wing and as a mentor. And a couple years later said, what are you going to do when you get out of here? Have you ever thought of graduate school? And honestly, I did not know what graduate school was about. Um, it was an abstract thing to me. And he thought I had a good chance to get in. And he was right. And eventually I got a PhD and then it was time to decide, do I go into industry? Do I work for a state or federal agency? Those would be mostly research positions. Go work at a university um, that has graduate programs or go back to a school like the one that I went to. And it wasn't a hard choice for me. Um, I started looking very much at schools like Augustana and St. Norbert is very much like that. The environment is the same. The mentoring relationship between faculty and students, um, it, everything that Dave said and Bonnie said is, is absolutely true. And, and it's just the environment I wanted to be in. I wanted to work closely with young people who are just feeling their way into the, into the science area and hopefully, you know, can help them achieve the goals that they want to. Um, when you're in a graduate program or teaching at a graduate program, like I was in at Madison, UW-Madison, there were 100 undergraduates, uh, there were about 50 graduate students, and all the focus was on the graduate students and the research and the grant writing and the money that that brought in. Um, it would not have worked out for me to be an undergraduate in that situation um, at all. I'm not sure I would have finished um, a bachelor's degree if I had transferred into a university program. And so to me personally, it made all the difference. And, and that's what got me to, to want to teach at a place just like that. And, and that's what I think St. Norbert is. Great, thank you. So we have our first student question from Logan. So thank you to Logan. Um, and his question is, what kind of interaction do you have with alumni? Do graduates of your programs continue to come back to you with questions or to work with your current students? So what does that look like for you? Go ahead, Dr. Olson. Uh, it's, we have our alumni back every year for a variety of things. They will show up for our SNC Day physics demo show and sometimes end up back in the show again. Uh, we will also bring them back as speakers at different points in their careers. Some who are in graduate school, some who recently graduated, some have been out a little while to bring some of that perspective back to our, stu to our current students about what life is like after you graduate from St. Norbert with a degree in physics and where they had, where they've gone with it, what the pluses, minuses, the challenges and all that. And we also get to hear about some really interesting research and professional work. Go ahead, Dr. McVeigh. Um, I'll second that with Mike, the alumni come back and, and they're very helpful and one of the ways we keep in touch with what happens out in industry and the like is, is that our students come back and talk to us or at least email us and fill us in. But in computer science, we have a senior capstone project and all of our students complete an individual project during their last semester. And this year, we of course had to do the presentations virtual and we had over 50 people in the chat room at one time watching and most of them were alumni that were coming back to see what this year's seniors had done. But more than that, some of them had actually been serving as mentors for some of those projects. And so our, we're really close with our alumni. Um, they keep us informed. Um, they celebrate with us uh, the accomplishments of, of each year's classes. And they offer ideas on, on different projects. 
Um, Cause we will solicit them and say, hey, do, do you have a, a cool project in mind that would fit our senior capstone? And because they understand St. Norbert and they understand the education that they received, they're really great sources for interesting projects. Thank you. Yeah, I'd echo uh, again what Dr. McVeigh um, uh, indicated there. The the number of alumni who are really eager to give back to the college and to the students and uh, to the faculty, I continue to be uh, amazed by. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the education, of course, that they receive here and the uh, inviting community that uh, we do have. Uh, reaching out to alumni to come back to speak on these faculty panels, I usually get really rapid and excited responses. Um, I've been here now for, I think this will be my 14th year, so um, I was kind of surprised at the uh, doctors the other day walking through uh, the hallway, and um, it wasn't the other day, it was actually a couple of months ago, seeing a sign for welcome our new physician, it was a St. Norbert grad. And these are individuals that um, we can then contact not only for uh, advice, but also potential shadowing opportunities, starting to build sort of this arsenal, if you will, of individuals who specialize in all of these uh, areas that we can direct students to, and they're always happy to have conversations with uh, current students. So it's, uh, it's been a delight to uh, interact with alumni. Go ahead, Dr. Mayer. Yeah, I mean, I'd add, you know, I'd echo all of the things that other people have shared. There's lots of sort of professional networking sorts of things. Students say it's, many students stay connected. Um, but also sort of to to the first point, um, you know, we, uh, as I say, several, many of us get invited to weddings, get invited to that sort of thing, right? Where there's sort of a personal connection with students, even as they move um, on, you know, I routinely get coffee with my research students when they're back in town, even now they're, you know, maybe old enough to have graduated from their next thing, right? That sort of thing. So uh, there's sort of personal and professional connections back that many um, faculty, that's why we do this and why I work here and not somewhere else, but also that students were really connected and found rewarding and wanna keep up. So I think those are both cool ways we stay connected with alumni. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Wilson. Just real quick, as these things, as, as Dr. Meyer mentioned, you know, as now we go back out and we see the generation cycling, I've actually sat data acquisition shifts at the National Laboratories with three of my alumni. And one of them had the uh, pleasure of waking me up at 2.30 in the morning to tell me he'd fixed a problem. And I asked him why he called me. He said, says, says right here, call run coordinator. Great, thank you. So uh, one thing that uh, I think is really important about the St. Norbert experience, but particularly as it relates to the natural sciences is that research piece. Uh, so could you talk a little bit more specifically about you know, if a student were interested in uh, doing research, specifically collaboratively with one of you, what would that process be and what does that look like for students who are interested in doing research or field experience or something that's more hands-on within the field? Go ahead, Dr. Meyer. Yeah, so um, I'll take this one. I know chemistry has kind of a similar program to math, um, but we have an endowment that funds a couple students a year to do collaborative research. So um, what that means is that you, there's an application process for math majors and minors for our program. Uh, and then we pick a couple people, we've had up to four or so students a, a summer, um, but then they get paid to live on campus and to come do research every day. So my research students, I meet with them in the morning, um, at our math research room, we give them like swipe access to the labs and stuff like that. And then they come in and we talk about the project we're working on and um, then they go forth and research 
and then we meet again the next day. Um, and one of the cool things that the college has done in the last couple of years has been to connect a lot of the students doing research on campus together so they don't get, so they don't feel, because it could be kind of isolating if it was just like you and two other people you knew in math and that was the only people you knew on campus. So they have done a little bit of work uh, through, um, math has done this individually, but also through the SURF program. Um, to connect the students, oh, there's a math student and there's a sociology student and there's a, and then they have lunch together and do that kind of stuff. So that's um, been pretty cool. And then um, I'm writing a paper with a student I had last summer. Um, right now we should, hopefully we'll submit it next week. So um, sometimes they lead to what's hopefully gonna be a peer reviewed publication. Sometimes they don't, but um, we get to do real cool stuff, so. Great. Go ahead, Dr. Wilson. I think also following on what Seth said and following up on Bonnie's comments earlier, this close connection that we have with our students also allows us to better tailor, if you will, your the research experience to your individual intellectual and professional interests. And many times these projects grow organically. And what I mean by that is, uh, a student might do a some laboratory exercise and their first thought is, oh my gosh, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is so tedious. And that actually, that question can launch a research project in automated controls. In fact, did. Um, you know, so we have this flexibility to tailor, you know, fine tune the research to best fit what your goals are not just the goals of the research, but your own goals. Because in the end, this is really about you. Wonderful. Any cool examples of research projects? I know you all have very cool examples, but um, anything specific that stands out that anyone wants to share? I can give uh, some biology uh, examples. Um, so Dr. Chowdhury, for example, is a uh, parasitologist. He literally goes around the world collecting and identifying uh, sometimes even new species of uh, parasites, doing molecular characterizations of them, uh, taking images uh, of them with a scanning electron microscope that we have uh, in the Gilmova Science Center on campus. And if you search uh, his name, Anindo, A-N-I-N-D-O, um, you'll likely happen upon one of those pages that show some of those images, really cool stuff. Um, uh, another, Dr. Kisman, is uh, an ecologist, aquatic ecologist. She studies a number of things from uh, invasive species to uh, something called trophic interactions, where if there's some ecologic disturbance, for example, that takes out uh, this particular organism, well, what happens then to the levels of the organisms that eat that one or the ones that were eaten by that organisms who, organism whose level again has increased or uh, decreased. Uh, we have a number of cell biologists who do a variety of things from microbiology, which uh, of course is a rather hot topic now. We have a microbiologist, Dr. Honeycutt, who uh, is studying a certain bacterial infection in fish, which you see in some inland lakes, like for example, Lake Winnebago, um, but also in like fish farms where they grow uh, salmon and other sorts of things. Um, he is along with a collabor collaborator at Wisconsin Milwaukee, uh, attempting to develop a vaccine for this bacterial species. So those are just a few examples of a number of projects most uh, biology faculty have four to five research students in their lab at any one time. Some can start as uh, freshmen, um, and that's great because uh, sometimes it takes uh, a really long time to do a project and eventually get to data that one can present at a conference. Uh, it's pretty cool seeing something like that. I My first scientific conference was in 1995, the Society for Neuroscience Conference in Washington, D.C. So to take students to that conference now, which is the largest scientific conference, it has about 35,000 uh, people attend, is, uh, is pretty cool. I had one student a couple of years ago who went to four Society for Neuroscience Conferences presenting uh, our work. So again, the, um, say the sky's the limit, um, 
And I think that's accurate in terms of what one can do with uh, conference presentations and publications and such. Um, and if one is interested in a specific area of research, reach out uh, to a faculty member and uh, sort of begin that conversation. Thank you. So we're starting to get some really great questions from students. Um, and one is sort of related to research as well. Um, he would like to know, is it possible to do research independently or does it have to be in collaboration for one of you? Go ahead, Dr. Olson, or Dr. Ham, excuse me. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that, I think for the whole group, because I think we'd all say the same thing. I think the, it'd be, it's helpful to understand, for example, how research is often done at the graduate level uh, for someone who might go get a master's or a PhD, especially for a master's degree. Um, usually what happens is um, you'll be asked or offered an opportunity to work as part of the research program of your advisor. And that can often mean that you don't have as much freedom, if, if any at all, in some cases, to decide what it is that you're doing research on. Um, I think one of the really big differences at a small undergraduate college like St. Norbert is, and someone spoke to this a little bit earlier, is when you mention, if you use the word independent, I think what you mean is can you, your interests drive what the project really is and we help supervise that. And I would say that happens a lot, um, maybe more than half. Um, in some cases, an individual professor maybe has a research program and they have the opportunity to draw you in and work uh, kind of with them more collaboratively. Um, but you really do, I think, at a place like this, it, it's happened almost all the time in my cases when the student said, I'd really like to get a research experience where I said, well, what interests you in general? And oh, here are half a dozen ideas of things that I think would make good projects that I could help you with. But this can be your own. You, you can be the person who takes the lead on this um, and we tailor it depending on what your interests really are. Um, and I think that happens a lot at a place like St. Norbert, more so than, than let's say at the university level. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so I think this is a really great question. Uh, Seth has asked, uh, what characteristics have you seen in successful students in your classes? Feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Dr. McVeigh. Okay, so um, there's lots of reasons for studying some subjects. And so one of the things we get in computer science often is people are interested in, in wanting to be the game programmer or because they want a good job. Um, but the best students, I think, are those with a keen interest in the topic just because of their interest in the topic um, or the area, um, uh, a real inquisitiveness about how things work and why I study this and how does this relate to something I might be doing in the future. Um, and then I think a lot of people uh, think in the sciences that we're not good communicators. And um, I really think one of the, the, some of our best students are those who learn to communicate their ideas with their classmates and with, with us and, and just share their knowledge and share their joy for the subject matter. I think, I think those are the students that do best in, in the sciences. You gotta be inquisitive and you gotta to wanna to push. And it's, some of it is self-satisfying and some of it is, is, is for other reasons, but, but mostly it has to be driven by an inquisitiveness within you. I would, oh, go ahead, go ahead Seth, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, so I'll tell all of you the same thing I tell my first year calculus class. So Calc 2, for example, is known as a more challenging intro class than many things. Um, and the real thing that helps separate students who end up being really successful and students who have a harder time is how much they come talk to me, how much they come interact with their faculty members, right? We're trying to do things that you might have thought of in a high school calculus class is, you know, what in Wisconsin, it's like 180 days, 180 hours, right? We get in a college class, that's more like 45 hours. So it's gonna go a lot faster. But you also 
right? I'm teaching fewer classes than I would in high school. I'm setting these office hours. I survey my students for when they can come to try to make sure that you guys can actually come to them. Uh, and then I try to be as available as possible to help because it's you're going to get stuck maybe, right? You didn't buy the calc book on your own to just learn it in your free time. You're taking it here, right? At St. Norbert or somewhere, right? So I, my, I, the reason I like this job is that I get to work with students and get to help you guys figure this out. And so students who take advantage of that are often really, really successful, even in classes that you might think of as hard or difficult um, that have lots of advanced content. It, it's, uh, to me, that's the biggest mark for how, su how successful students end up being, especially in the long run. If you build that kind of habit early, uh, that'll carry you all the way through uh, and get you really, really successful at going to graduate professional school or whatever you want to do. I'm going to follow up on what Seth just said. I think it's also very important for our students to have a willingness to embrace challenge, even if that means risking a big goof up or several goof ups. So it's about the process, not necessarily the end point. And my most successful students were the ones who would go, go for it day one and were willing to make mistakes, admit their mistakes, dust themselves off and keep on going and those are the ones that were usually the most successful awesome thank you so we have a question about internships um, this person is asking specifically about uh, internships within biology so dr bailey i think you can take that one but if anyone else also wants to share some examples of cool internships that your students have done within your department that would be great but why don't we start with dr bailey first Um, yeah, so we have a, a number of students who do these. We uh, have a course designation for uh, internships, so one can get, uh, of course, credit for it. Um, there's a student right now that I'm uh, mentoring who is doing uh, an internship at a local hospital in medical genetics. Uh, so she's working with a medical geneticist because that's her primary interest, of course, um, doing a lot of the day-to-day -day patient stuff, uh, as well as conversations with that individual. And then uh, we break out and have conversations about some of the literature and the basic science that's behind uh, particular things. Uh, that's just one uh, of many examples. That's a health-related one. There are a lot of industry examples that uh, we could also provide. Um, that is a kind of a self-starter thing. And as many of my colleagues indicated, right, the, the students that um, have this interest and wanna uh, apply what they've learned in the classroom to uh, these areas can then start to seek out these opportunities and talk about them with their academic advisor. And you really have to work through a solid plan and have objectives in place, uh, but they can be really, really rewarding uh, experiences. Uh, we also have some partnerships with uh, some local companies for uh, paid internships through uh, a National Science Foundation grant uh, that we have. And if you go to the Natural Science uh, website, uh, there's a link and we can also share it too. To, it's a National Science Foundation Scholarships in STEM grant. And uh, a part of the grant, and there are several components to it, uh, are either paid research opportunities over the summer, and we uh, chatted about those briefly, or a paid internship. And we have, uh, again, a number of uh, local partners that we're working with. Run, one, Rockline uh, Industries out of Sheboygan. You perhaps haven't heard of Rockline, but um, I bet you've used one of their products from Clorox disinfectant wipes, which we can't find a lot of uh, lately, right? They get the paper substrate and they manufacture the chemical uh, to add then uh, to it to essentially make Clorox disinfectant wipes. They make a number of Walmart brand wipes like makeup remover and baby wipes and other sorts of things. Um, I'll give you a really brief example of a project that students worked on uh, and one is interning with them. Um, Rockline uh, had a particular chemical that they got from some supplier that they knew at some point 
uh, they were either going to run out of or because it came from a spot in the Middle East, there might be some geopolitical considerations about whether or not they'd be able to get this. They found a supplier in the United States that makes something that they thought was similar, but they didn't know. Uh, and so we have uh, in our science building uh, a nuclear magnetic resonance imager. And one probably doesn't think of um, a Catholic liberal arts uh, college having a nuclear magnetic resonance imager. We have one. Uh, and this student with Rockline worked with a, a chemistry faculty member, uh, John Russell, to essentially determine the makeup using uh, the NMR and some other techniques uh, of this uh, chemical to essentially determine that, yeah, it's the same as this other thing that was supplied in uh, or, or that they got from this other supplier. So uh, that led now to an internship and there are students who are working uh, with them and we're talking about actually tomorrow some additional projects that Rockline would like us uh, to do. Um, and it's really valuable for our students, of course. It's really valuable for uh, the company. So. Um, could talk about a number of other internship uh, examples. Um, and again, if anyone has questions over and above those, feel free to reach out. Dr. Bailey, you touched on this a little bit, but do you want to go a little bit more in depth about the National Science Foundation STEM grant? Because that's applicable to students that are interested in pretty much all the majors on this call with the exception of uh, pre-health. So if you wanna talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah, so last year the college was awarded um, uh, a five-year grant from the National Science Foundation, about $1 million. And uh, well over two thirds of that is dedicated to scholarships for students uh, who are academically talented, um, which is characterized by having a high school GPA greater than 3.75. Uh, there are some ACT considerations in that, although uh, I know we're moving to a test optional uh, model. Um, there's a recommendation letter, an essay, an interview, and we can provide a scholarship uh, up to $10,000 if there is indeed $10,000 of unmet uh, financial need. Uh, for each year and then students are part of this cohort. So we're welcoming our first cohort uh, in a few weeks. In fact, on Sunday, August 16th, they, they will arrive on campus. And we have a number of things that are central to it. Uh, this program, uh, an early arrival program. So students in uh, who are these STEM scholars arrive on campus four to five days uh, before the rest of the students uh, participate in a number of activities. They have uh, a guaranteed research or internship uh, experience that they're provided, again, paid over the summer. They participate in our academic peer mentor program, something we uh, developed a couple of years ago, uh, and is kind of this combination of teaching assistant and uh, tutoring that students will get. Uh, it's not additional instruction, it's essentially a recitation section that uh, students who took the course will facilitate in the evening for students in uh, a certain course. So in addition to receiving that peer mentoring, these scholars will become then uh, peer mentors. And there are many other aspects that are associated with the program. If it is something that you are uh, interested in, I know Mary Beth can uh, speak to that. I'm happy to answer questions uh, as well uh, about it. Um, uh, again, if you uh, need more information regarding it. Yes, absolutely. And we'll have contact information for both Dr. Bailey and I at the end of the presentation. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to answer any of those questions. Um, so this is a, an interesting question. Um, and really, any of you can, can take this on. If you could advocate for one specific resource on campus that would help improve academic life for a first year student, what would that be? So any kind of dream big thing that you would love to see on campus that would um, help first year students get kind of acclimated to academic life on campus or anything, anything in general? Uh, first, that is a great question. Um, five years ago, I would have said a new science building. So now we have that. Um, 
uh, particular pieces of equipment. I don't think we're in want of much in terms of what we need for a variety of things. Um, I'm going to politely deflect that question and put the pressure on one of my colleagues to answer it. That's a really, really good uh, question. Go ahead, Dr. Wilson. I'll take a crack at it because I think many of our disciplines here, I think, already have this. And now, I, I mean, it's my 22nd year, I think. And this didn't exist when I arrived. And part of what Dr. Bailey just mentioned with the new science facility really fosters this, um, this thing. And it's not just, it's a physical space where our students can get together on their own in the evening and just work on stuff without faculty around where they can interact, they can build their community by themselves. And I think all of our disciplines have this uh, scattered throughout the science building. Um, we have a room down here in, in, in the lower level, the basement, I guess, um, where physics is. And this is where our students congregate. And the biggest thing that can help a first year student who's just trying to find their way through college and get, you know, get their feet on the ground is to get into the community, to have that community of upper class students who are not as scary as you might think. They're actually extremely nice. They're extremely helpful. And guess what? They just did what you're doing. And they know, they know the drill. They know how things work. And they know us. So you can get some really good intelligence on what we think is important. Um, so that's my, and I think we have this. You know, and it's just not, it's not just the physical space. It's the community. It's the learning community of our students. So I would kind of echo what Dr. Bailey said, because the new science facility allowed us to create these spaces for our students, but it is really the students that create and foster that community. And I think Dr. Olson really hit it. And just to emphasize that point, we were all involved in the design of the building and the design of the building was based on what do we want in terms of how we teach and who we teach. And again, at the risk of deflecting that question, I think we really have kind of that thing that begins to foster, uh, as Dr. Olson mentioned, that sense of community and collaboration and just being invested and engaged in science. It's all uh, part of that physical space. Absolutely. And just a, just a quick note uh, about the Gail Mulva Science Center. Uh, for students on the call who have not had a chance to visit campus yet, we are open for tours on a limited basis. So we'd love to have you up to campus so that you can see in person some of what the faculty are talking about here. Um, we are getting a lot of great questions from students, so hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. But students, if we're not able to get to your question uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, um, please reach out to the faculty if you have specific questions about specific disciplines. Uh, but this one is really applicable to all of you. Um, Logan is asking, how does studying abroad mesh with the natural sciences courses? Um, and do you have many students that do study abroad, and what does that look like? Go ahead, Dr. McVeigh. So um, one of the really good things I think we do at St. Norbert is you are almost always assigned an advisor in your major or at least close to your major. And even if you aren't, you will soon know a faculty member in your major. So one of the things about studying abroad, at least in computer science, is many of our classes are spring only or fall only or every other fall or every other spring. So if you wanna study abroad, all you have to do is speak up ahead of time. Um, doesn't have to be freshman year, but, but it, certainly in your sophomore year, if you're planning on going abroad junior year, you should be having those conversations with um, someone in, for me it would be in computer science, it's about where you're thinking of going, when you're thinking of going, and we usually can find something there that will transfer back and that you will have the prerequisites for. As long as we have a little bit of heads up, it's doable.
Go ahead, Dr. Olson. Uh, yeah, I, I don't echo what Bonnie just said. Um, again, given the time, given a little head, you know, a little lead lead time, we can often help you to craft a program for yourself that not only satisfies the requirements, but I've had students for which the uh, the school overseas actually had courses that were more specifically tailored to what that student wanted to do. Um, in one case, it was civil engineering or marine engineering. And, you know, we don't offer marine engineering here, but this school in Britain did. So we actually were able to substitute a course that was more applicable to this young gentleman's future plans than one in our curriculum. So we actually created a stronger curriculum for him when he went abroad. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, students that have an interest in, say, marine biology, right? And uh, we're not going to offer that, uh, but they can study abroad in Australia and they can take a bunch of really good marine biology courses and, hey, there happens to be a lot of marine biology stuff like right there where they're studying and transfers in. Um, I've had students take such specific courses with, say, an interest in veterinary studies of like, uh, equine anatomy and pathophysiology. Yep, uh, we go through the syllabus and make sure it meets sort of the, the rigor that we would expect in terms of content and that transfers in as uh, an elective. Something that uh, went by the wayside for obvious reasons in the last few months, we've uh, started this partnership with uh, a university in Madrid. Uh, it's a Catholic university, CEU San Pablo. Um, they teach a number of courses in both uh, Spanish and in English, and I was able to sit in on an anatomy and physiology course in English in which they were talking about uh, red blood cell structure and function. They talked about the exact same stuff that we talk about in our course here. They have uh, a medical school on campus. They have uh, an optometry school on campus, physical therapy. Uh, it's in Madrid, which was great. Um, and again, a number of English speaking courses. So a lot of students study abroad in Spanish speaking countries. Uh, this is one in which we're going to have uh, set up relatively soon, again, delayed a bit by uh, the pandemic, uh, some really specific uh, articulation agreements about what courses transfer over and how that ultimately works with someone's uh, curriculum. Great, thank you. So uh, Evan is asking a specific question for Dr. Ham. Um, he's interested in what are some of the top careers that environmental science majors go into or do most of them go on to graduate school? Sure, um, I can kind of give you two parallels. So I can speak a little bit about geology and environmental science. And here, I think those are actually our two kind of environmental tracks. Um, and I can kind of tell you why that is in a second, but when I have a student who comes in and is undecided between the two or thinks they have an interest in one area and maybe not so much in the other, even though they'll wind up taking courses in geology when they're in environmental science and chemistry and so on. If a student has an interest more in the ecology side of things, they wanna work with organisms, then I think environmental science is the way to go or the organismal biology track in the biology program. If they're more interested in the physical kind of nature of environmental issues, and what I mean is you're using chemistry and mathematics and computer science to understand uh, physical phenomena. Climate change is a perfect example of that. Then going through a geology track typically makes a little more sense, but I always encourage students to take courses that even may not be required in some of those other areas. Um, so what are students doing? I would say 60 to 70% of our geology students in the last 15 years are going in directly into environmental work. So they're working primarily um, for environmental consulting companies. Uh, and a large amount of that work really involves cleaning up the messes that we've made, uh, often that are industrial in nature. So for example, cleaning up contaminated rivers. You know, how do you do that? It, it needs science, it needs engineering, it needs partnerships with other areas of expertise. That um, kind of work, protecting and cleaning up surface and groundwater, 
maintaining environments uh, that are important ecosystems like wetlands, for example. Um, so working with water and that kind of physical aspect has really been kind of the track that many geology students have gone into and many of the environmental science students may actually get work and have in the same companies, but they're going to be involved in the ecological assessments. So for example, they might do statistical models to understand when you have a certain contaminant, chemical contaminant in the environment, uh, what is the rate of mortality for certain kinds of fish or amphibians, for example, in an ecosystem that result from that. And oftentimes they work collaboratively with people like geologists or hydrologists. So we're still seeing, I think, a pretty heavy emphasis, no matter what track you take in getting employment in the environmental field. Um, the other options to a lesser extent would be working for a federal agency. We've had several students from both areas go work for the EPA and the Environmental Protection Agency really is kind of the agency that decides what are the priorities for the nation for cleaning up you know, problems or preserving certain ecosystems, so on and so forth. Some have gone to work for the um, US Geological Survey, which for a while had a US Biological Survey that was a component of it. Um, and so that's been kind of the track through the federal area. So consulting companies do most of the work. They actually do the cleanup. The EPA and the federal agencies that are you know, uh, parallel to them basically decide what do we need to clean up and provide oversight. And then the other area that probably has been more like 20 to 30% of the students in both areas is continuing on to graduate school and perhaps becoming um, a research professor or professor at an institution like ours. And so those tend to be the major areas that people are going into. Great, thank you. Kind of along those same lines, does anyone else have any really cool outcomes or student success stories from your specific area that you want to share? Uh, I have a couple uh, that I can give you. It's two students, um, Andrew Regent Smith and Raquel Zarb. They graduated several years ago, um, did uh, medical school at uh, MCW in Milwaukee. Uh, they're both doing residencies right now in reconstructive plastic surgery. And uh, Raquel uh, had emailed one day uh, and uh, asked to chat on the phone and we chatted and she was so excited because that day she did a surgery in which uh, someone who had cancer and lost a jaw, they replaced his jaw with a bone from his feet. Uh, and I mean, that sort of stuff or a portion of his femur, uh, just really incredible work. Um, and again, in biology, we have a number of individuals uh, or students who go on uh, to do pre-health related things and they're in reconstructive plastic surgery and general surgery and orthopedic surgery, a lot of family medicine uh, uh, physicians. So uh, it's really uh, great to hear stories like that. And it, again, like we were talking about before, especially to hear from them years later when they're just so excited to say <laughs> they did something like that. Great. Go ahead, Dr. McVeigh. Um, we have a couple folks who are, are, are working with a few companies you might know. Um, AWS, for instance, the head of Wisconsin is one of our grads. He graduated some time ago and was working for various companies and, and AWS came after him and he now heads up the Wisconsin uh, version of that. And even before that happened though, um, one of our majors from 2019 is working for Amazon Web Services down in Austin. Uh, she also was recruited, which was uh, really a wonderful thing for us. Um, we've had several kids go on to graduate school, and um, one of them is, I think, a year from his PhD, but he's been, this is his second summer out at Microsoft um, doing machine learning. And one of the cool things about that is his senior capstone assignment that we gave him was about machine learning. So he has carried that through through his PhD, and he's now on his second internship out at Microsoft for the summer. Go ahead, Dr. Olson. Unmute. Okay, there we go. Um, following along 
Dr. McVeigh said, and you know, we also had a recent graduate in physics. Uh, we came back uh, last year to give a talk, and he's at the University of Notre Dame. I think it's the second or third year of graduate school now, and he recently received uh, an, an National Science Foundation graduate fellowship. He designs uh, adaptive optics for uh, major telescopes. So he's actually working for a world-class astronomer at Notre Dame, and they're actually designing systems to remove the air shimmer uh, from the images of these, these super large telescopes that you see the pictures of on the mountaintops in Hawaii and Chile. Um, and so he's been very, very excited about that and his uh, ability to, you know, travel to these scopes and try out these new designs for their adaptive optics. So they're basically clearing the night sky, if you will, uh, and allowing uh, these scopes to peer out, you know, billions of light years out into the universe. And uh, so I, mean, I think, you know, it's been very, very exciting to watch his progress and he's been really uh, making great strides in that area. Michael, were you going to mention that Sam was my research student or were you just going to claim him for physics? <laughs> so the student Michael's talking about was a research student of mine in math. He was a math and physics double major. Um, and so I'll just quick plug math That's here. Okay. But, That's right. uh, it's so, a good point. Yeah, but we have had people do sports analytics. We've had people go do all sorts of financy modeling, make buckets of money sorts of things. We've had people go and do computer science or actuarial or almost anything. If you get a math degree, you can do a lot of quantitative work in many, many different fields. So I'll be quiet. I didn't want to let you have Sam just for yourself, Michael. Well, I think that's a very good point that Dr. Meyer makes is that, and Dr. Ham alluded to the very same thing in answering his question, that you hear about, you're hearing about the natural collaboration between the majors. You know, if Seth is right, is Sam was a math and physics major. And there's a very strong interplay between those two and, you know, computer science, physics, math, and geology, environmental science, biology, all, so when you think about your academic pathway, don't limit yourself to one thing, whether that's math or geology or computer science or biology or physics, chemistry. Think you, I encourage you to think more broadly because there is a very close interrelationship and interdependency between all of our fields. And that's something to think about as you go forward. And it is easy to double major at St. Norbert College too. Mm -hmm or can be done. I shouldn't say it's easy. <laughs> Go ahead, and Dr. Rick. I do have to say, Seth, Jordan did a math major and a CS major, and he's out at Microsoft, but Carson and Maggie didn't, so. But, but yeah, I'll share Jordan with you. Great, so we have about two minutes left. Um, students, any last questions or faculty, any last thoughts or anything else that you are hoping to share before we wrap up here. I right. meant to say, you know, if anything that any of us said sounded cool or interesting, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to uh, field emails, you know, have a quick Google Hangout, something like that. It's, you know, it's kind of what. It's why we're it's why we're at a school like St. Norbert and not a school like where I did my graduate work, where I was the TA for 300 people. So to uh, to that point, I have uh, slides up. Um, we have an, an, the next slide. Um, we'll have the remaining faculty, but I just want to leave this up for a minute in case anyone wants to screenshot it or write down any any specific contact information for any of the faculty that were here today. I'm going to move on to the next slide now. All right. And then this is the slide, uh, some contact information for our admission team. Um, we break our, our uh, admission groups up by geographic area. So it lists here uh, who everybody covers. 
Um, so don't he hesitate to reach out to any of us as well if you have questions or um, want us to connect you with one of the faculty, we're happy to do that as well. Um, and as I said, we are welcoming students to visit campus right now. So if you're hoping to set up a visit, you can visit snc.edu slash go slash visit. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to connect you with one of these great faculty if you have any questions. And thank you all so much for participating today. I think this was really helpful, um, really helped clarify a lot about our natural sciences. So um, thanks again for joining us. And I'll stay on for a few minutes in case students have any other questions that, that they wanna share in the chat. So thank you all so much, have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>